Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, gang. Thanks, Rachel. Uh, looking out here, I see so many familiar faces. I kind of feel like I'm at home having a party. And so, so I, I feel like if we're just going to order pizza later, we'll get the Jenga out, the Domino's, we'll have a good time. So thank you all for being here. Um, I'm looking forward to this talk. It's actually quite an interesting uh, flip on what I would normally speak to, and we'll get into that along the way. But um, I do want to say thank you very much to Rachel. I also want to say uh, thank you to Chris as well. Uh, I also want to say when the charming and talented Rachel Ash first approached me about uh, doing a talk here at Hot Art Wet City, I was delighted. I, I love the work that both Chris and Rachel are doing here at Hot Art Wet City, and, I, and you should too. So donate if you can, which you already have done with the tickets, so thank you all very much for that. But really, go buy some art. You know, absolutely contribute to your local culture and community of artists, etc. Okay. <laughs> And we can, we, can t we can wax poetic on this, but with Creative Mornings, with the GDC, when we have an outreach of creativity, you have a great opportunity to support culture and community of creativity and absolutely make the world a, a more beautifully intriguing place. How did that sound? I wrote that a couple of times and thought it sucked, but I'll deliver it. Beautiful, beautiful, beautifully intriguing? Okay. All right, so back to Rachel. Uh, when Rachel asked me to speak here, in my head I was thinking about speaking to the many areas that I've created curriculum for, that I've already consulted on, or that I've, I've been asked to speak on before. And uh, I'm going to read my notes out loud. Uh, things like the creative process, business of design, post-production techniques. Uh, and I mentioned some of these options to Rachel and asked her, you know, what she thought I should speak about. And we'll just dive in a little bit more. And I'm going to get ahead. This is the stuff that she did mention partially and some that she might have missed, you know, things like... <laughs> and, and, oh, and this is... <laughs> No, that, that's, Mark uh, gave me this subtitle a little while ago, which is awesome. Um, but when, uh, when I was speaking to Rachel about what I should talk about, she looked at me semi-sheepishly and asked if I'd be willing to speak about Lego. And I said, I said Lego? I said, Lego, she said. And we silently stared at each other for a while while I processed this surprising request. And I thought, <laughs> Lego, I said, and Lego, she said. And I thought, fuck yeah, Lego. <laughs> <laughs> of course we're going to talk about Lego. It's a ridiculously hilarious, fun, happy thing that exists in the world. And we'll, we'll touch into why in a second. So why not? I'd be happy to speak about it. So a little bit about what exactly is Lego and why am I so smitten by it. And I'm just going to do a bit of a poll. So how many of you would qualify yourselves as a total Lego nerd? You know, I do. Like only one to come on, come on. Nerds are going to rule the earth. We know that, right? <laughs> All right, so we got a few. And how many of you are sort of a fan of Lego? Okay, okay, that's awesome. So the rest, the Midland. And how many of you are just trying to figure out what the hell the attraction is? Other than Mark Bussey. <laughs> okay, it's a family affair back there. Awesome. Uh, there, I did dump a tub of Lego back there. So if it uh, reminded you of all those things of childhood uh, uh, that has been lost in the past and you just want to dive into it, by all means, please do so. So during the talk, if I get boring, go ahead and start building. Afterwards, go ahead and play and just explore. Because we'll be talking about the bricks themselves. It's actually quite a fascinating system. All right, cool. So let's get some facts. Uh, first of all, the name Lego is an abbreviation of the two Danish words, leg and got, meaning play well. And ironically, the word Lego in Latin also means I put together. Uh, totally accidental. And you love happenstance like that. So designers, when we're out there researching, we have to say, whoa, check that out. Except they realize about 20 years later. Uh, apparently they only had one dictionary in the office in Denmark at the time. Uh, the Lego Group was founded in 1932. So we're going back quite a ways by Ole uh, Kirk Christensen. And his family-run company has passed from father to son for over 80 years. And now is owned by Kjeld Kirk Christensen, a grandchild of the founder. It's come a long way in the last eight decades from a small carpenter's workshop to a modern global enterprise that is now, in terms of sales, the second largest toy company in the world. And that's pretty outstanding when you can think of Mattel, Hasbro, and the amount of brands they have under that umbrella. That's, that's quite a, uh, an accomplishment, especially considering it's all about the brick. An unpatented brick. They don't own a trademark, a registration, or anything for it. Anybody could go ahead and make this. And yet, when you pick up any uh, competitor's piece, you know it's not Lego. It's amazing. You see kids react to that instantly. The traditional Lego brick is now their most important product and was first introduced in 1949 in its current, or sorry, it first introduced the brick in 1949. They started in 32, but the company started uh, when his, his 
previous job was lost and so he just started making wooden toys. So Lego, the company, began with, with wooden toys, but after the war, started to trickle away with in regards to supplies and also the expense. Uh, scarcity as well. And so plastic was becoming the new material of choice. So enter the brick. The seemingly unsuspecting brick, the one that we don't want to step on. <laughs> you know it right away, right? <laughs> you, you got those scars, those screams, the terror. I even saw there's a great meme. I was recently this. Said, so on a scale of one to stepping on Lego, how bad is the pain? <laughs> it's awesome. The brick in its present form was launched in 1958. There are bricks, plates, and tiles. So for you nerds out there, you'll see that those little thin plates that are there. What you may know or not know is that if you stack three, that's exactly the height of a brick. Okay, now we get some engineering in here. Those tiles have no studs on top. Those things underneath are called tubes. Really simple, really easy, and you all know that significant click sound it makes when it comes together. Incredible machinery. We'll talk about how precise shortly. Uh, on average, there are over 80 Lego bricks for every person on Earth. Yeah, just absorb for a second. So. Carbon imprint be damned <laughs> at this point. <laughs> Think of the amount of plastic that's out there in respect to that. So we can talk about the ethos in that later, but what it can contribute versus plastic in a car, I'll argue that uh, imagination is a better tool than a vehicle. Um, there are 915 million ways to combine six Lego bricks. So you're <laughs> 915 million variations with just six Lego bricks. Yeah, I, I don't write this stuff. It's just, it's on the internet, <laughs> the Lego site. So it's got to be true. Approximately seven Lego sets are sold every second. So second largest toy company. We're starting to understand a little bit more about that. And the factory is so efficient that only 18 elements, Lego parts or Lego pieces are known as elements in the Lego system. And they're all out of, uh, during that process, it, it, the factory is so efficient, uh, so efficient that only 18 elements out of a million don't meet their standards. So we were just saying in regards to that, like think about what has uptime like that. That's better, up, that's better success rate than uptime on the internet or most uh, uh, web hosting sites. So it's pretty phenomenal. And from the Lego marketing department, the interlocking principle with its tubes makes it extremely unique. I hate that word in, in marketing. And offers unlimited building possibilities. Well, apparently it's not unlimited. There's 915 million for every six bricks. So I'm sure that's actually kind of quantifiable. Uh, it's just a matter of getting the imagination going and letting a wealth of creative ideas emerge through play. And letting a wealth of ideas, a, a wealth of creative ideas emerge through play. And that's what we want to talk about. We want to talk about creativity. I'm going to dive into that to a fair extent. There's enough, there are a number of very creative people in this room right now, so I'm, I'm glad for that. As opposed to just a bunch of Lego geeks, and we'll talk about that later. And <laughs> it's quite a crowd. And, and, and I'm one of them. Um, creativity, we talk about creativity and why we love it. It's not too hard to figure that out, but I'm going to speak that for a second. So creativity is seeing what everyone else has seen and thinking what no one else has thought. And this is what we're usually challenged with when we're trying to create something, when we're making something, when we're trying to do something new. The appropriation, the association, the elements of where we were or where other people have gone, and we try to do variations on that. But the idea of creativity is to create something new, to do something that has never been done before. And that's extremely difficult. And that's a place that we need to get to at least once in our lives and really take pride in that. So I hope you all can achieve that. But it's difficult to do. So we talk about that creative process. So why we love creativity, I believe, is because it is one of those rarest of rare opportunities to simultaneously think for yourself and place yourself outside of your comfort zone. After all, if we only ever do what we know, we can never grow. And I firmly believe that. If you only ever follow the same path, the same process, the same modus operandi, you will stagnate, you will plateau. And that's usually when we get frustrated. That in itself is a block. Although we have tried uh, the tried and true creative process to reference at each stage of milestone and sign off, we have, oh, sorry, that's my bad notes. I just repeated that. We have the creative process as a reference point for signing off. So even though we have this as a reference to sign off at each stage, we love to be challenged. We wish to better understand why we think the way we do, and we are constantly struggling with following a set of rules of engagement to assist our clients in visually communicating their product, service, or message. And we're also seeking new ways to explore and engage new ideation processes. 
So we already know what this is. This is what we go to. When usually when we're in working with a client, and how many of you are, are designers in, in, in the applied arts or are creating for clients? Okay, and you know that point where the client says to you, that's not what I asked for. And you go, yes, you did. And, and then you realize you didn't show them any iteration or have anything signed off on, and you didn't involve them in the process. This is that process, simplified. There's many connotations to the creative process, and you should explore them all. But in here is that study process, is that, that way of re-engaging the client and bringing them back on board with you and to be transparent. Just as an aside, I find that when we're engaging our clients directly and transparently in the very beginning, at a certain point in the process, they finally just say, you know what, will you just stop calling me? We know you're doing a good job, you're doing all right. Just keep going. Let me know when it's really important, okay? Which is wonderful. That, that, that's when you suddenly realize you do have a little bit of creative freedom. Seeking new ways of uh, ideation process. So it is this hunger for more that begins the potentially dangerous path to the creative block. It's innocuous at first, but then it builds to distractions, procrastination, avoidance. So what do we do? We need to dig deeper. When we're following the process, and we're going back to what I said before, it's that same process, your same MO, that same, same I don't want to say stylistic approach, but that same formula or recipe for how you achieve anything. And you're going through the motions. And you're suddenly realizing, whoa, I need to be challenged more. I want to be challenged more. So what tools do we have available to that? So speaking to that, this is where we can actually dive into the book of psychology and redefine our processes and look for creative solutions through tried and true ways. Now, tried and true at a level that we probably don't normally participate in. But as I describe these very briefly, you might find that you're already doing it. You just don't realize it. So we speak about incubation. It's a temporary break from creative problem solving. It can result in, that can result in insight. Incubation aids creative problem solving in that it enables forgetting of misleading clues. And that's when you're usually looking at something for so long, it, you stop seeing what the answer is. You know, it, even though it's right in front of you, you can't see it because it's clouded with familiarity, it's clouded with the same thing. You need to break away from that. And we'll speak to that specifically later. Convergent thinking involves aiming for a single correct solution to a problem, whereas divergent thinking involves creative generation of multiple answers to a set problem. And I'll do the immediate Lego uh, comparison here, where it's when you buy the set, you dump the bags open, or you follow them in numerical order, which is a whole new thing now. Virgo, anal retentive Virgo, totally numbered bag, numbered bag, numbered bag. And you open the instruction book and you follow everybody. And then there's those that just dump all the pieces, throw the book away, and they just start building. I'm in awe of that. And, and it took me a long time of sets organized before I finally realized I had too much and I wasn't keeping up with organization. Now it's just a whole bunch of bins and drawers everywhere and I don't know where to begin. That's a great place to be. As John Cage says, when you don't know where to start, begin anywhere. You know, just start. The creative cognition approach in which creativity takes place in two phases. A generative phase where an individual constructs representations and an exploratory phase where those structures are used to come up with creative ideas. So comparative. The explicit implicit interaction theory, which is a new one, is one that I just explored here recently, and it's constituting an attempt to provide a more unified explanation of relevant phenomena, in part by interpreting, integrating various existing theories of incubation and insight. Basically what you're doing is you're going back over all previous theories, finding out why they don't work, and creating a new one from that. Isn't that great? You can just reinvent a process along the way. It's kind of like filling holes in the street that you know aren't quite full, so you gotta go back the next year and refill it. It's a like job security for psychology up here right now. Conceptual blending, the concept of bisociation, that creativity arises as a result of the intersection of two quite different frames of reference. Which is interesting again, because we go back to the reference we know and that we're familiar with, and how do we get exposed to a newer reference point? Once again, distraction or removal, or what we'll refer to later as drift. The honing theory states that creativity arises due to the self-organizing, self-mending nature of a worldview. And that is, by the way, of creative process, the individual hones an integrated worldview, which I like to consider the, uh, the opinion of everybody around you. <laughs> you know that, that sterile feeling you get when you've got decision by committee and you've got this great idea and once everyone gets their say in it, it turns down to this, eh, it's not quite there anymore. It's like introducing tart and ending up with orange. It's like, where did the excitement go? It's totally gone. So in respect to creativity and everyday imagination, or sorry, everyday imaginative thought, this is that wonderful moment, but because with so many tools of ideation at our disposal, and I hope that some of you uh, recognize some new ones there and definitely take note of them because they're fantastic places of exploration, no matter how dry my definitions were. With all these tools, we still get stuck. 
You know, we still get stuck. And why is that? Because we can't see the forest for the trees, because we're tired, because Confucius says if you wish to hide something, put it right in front of them, because of deadline pressure, because it's high tide, because Mercury is in retrograde. You know, we just don't know. There's just some times where we're trying to do something and we just can't battle through it. So what I like to do is have a look at uh, uh, various ways of removing and seeking another way because we love that aha moment. We absolutely love it when we, we get that moment that can spontaneously erupt when we think, if only, if only, and how do we get that other way of seeing? So how do we, uh, dis how do we disengage from the lateral thinking, or sorry, how do we engage lateral thinking or distracted thinking we have read, that we have read in books like The Art of Looking Sideways and Thinking Creatively, Yet time and time again, the creative block is, has built a seemingly insurmountable obstacle in front of us. We love ideas, so of course, we hate the creative block. So why do we hate them? Why do we hate the creative block? So there's nothing more debilitating to a creative than to not be able to create, even momentarily, because we demand more of ourselves. We know we're better than that. We know we can do it, but we're still stagnating to a certain degree. So there are a myriad of possible techniques. We spoke to a few already for brainstorming, ideation in a nonlinear fashion, but this talk is about one in particular, one way to smash a creative block. So in regards to why we absolutely hate creative blocks, well, it's because basically they suck ass. There's nothing worse than being in that space where you absolutely can't do anything. You're, you're held back. It's, it's really restraining and it's no fun at all. So how are we gonna get out of that? Well, if you're not familiar with the name Bruce Mao, Canadian designer, uh, and he years ago posted his incomplete manifesto for growth. And in that incomplete manifesto for growth, which is one that I encourage most of you to look at if you haven't already, there's something called drift. And so drift is to simply allow yourself to wander aimlessly, to explore adjacent uh, adjacencies, to lack judgment, and to postpone critics, criticism. You know, it's the same thing about learning about Lego if your last name is Bussy. If you postpone criticism, you might, you might actually find a place of enjoyment and fun. You just, just, you just let that go. Exploring adjacency. Does anybody know Brian Eno's Oblique Strategies? You know, okay. So something else you can just reach out to. There's even an app for that now. Which you use, it used to be a very rare set of cards to get. And just when you were stuck, just grab a card, flip it over, and just take yourself somewhere else. Uh, I, I'm pretty much uh, confident that... Um, uh, Cards Against Humanity probably started in some form in that too, because there's some pretty dark places it travels. It's that Swiss type. It comes up all the time. <laughs> um, so looking towards a drift. So for me, as a child, I love playing with toy cars and later on, I had the same hair then almost too. No, no, it's still, still more there. Um, uh, I, started, I loved playing with toy cars and later uh, loved uh, building elaborate plastic model cars before I blew them up in the East Van Alley way with black market fireworks, of course. But uh, <laughs> uh, So my drift began when I saw a designer friend of mine, Michael Surtees, now in New York. Hey, how you doing? Um, he was Instagramming the build process of a Lego VW camper van. And I was intrigued. I enjoyed watching the process. I congratulated him on Instagram when it was done. It made me smile because I hadn't realized it, but it was bringing me back to that time of building and playing and just enjoying. I had pretty much forgotten all about it until I found myself at Oak Ridge Mall after a big week of work and stumbled into the new Lego store. I don't know if, has anybody been there? But it's, it's, it's hideous, isn't it? Like, like as far as just too bright. Because when, when you've had a bad week and you're just that, your inner goth is screaming and you're all in black and you're low on coffee and, and you're walking by that Lego and it is the biggest monstrosity of color and impact. You just don't want it. So it didn't fit my, my taste at all. Bright colors, loud people, children. <laughs> The, the entire ceiling was a giant Lego brick and the tubes underneath with their lighting. And that's it. Oh, that's kind of it. No, 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 it's just so bright in here. And uh, uh, it, it, sit in the tubes. Um, it was hideous and it was awesome because as I was drifting. I was in a new environment of sensory overload and I had forgotten why I was upset. I was just somewhere else. I was drifting and didn't even know I was taken somewhere else. And in there, just as I was about to leave, I looked over and I saw this large box with a VW camper van on the front of it. And it was amazing. Like, I'm, I'm a bit of a, I'll buy things quickly, but usually with some kind of um, calculated risk involved. But I just walked up to it, 
picked it up. I was surprised by its weight and half of it. Wow, it's, and it's big. It's a big box. And I, said, and I didn't look at the price. I just took it, went to the cash register, <laughs> went out, paid it, grabbed it in my big bright yellow bag. <laughs> And I jumped on the sky train and went home and I just sat down and started building. And, and that was it. It was just, it was absolutely fantastic. So it was just an amazing opportunity just to go ahead, explore, dive in and enjoy. So the, see, <laughs> the big yellow bag. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think there was a point where it got a little excited. I could pretty much uh, wrap all of our furniture in Lego bags probably too, if I turned into that crazy old man and old lady there. Uh, it was amazing. So, so by the time I was home and building, is it was just incredible that. Um, uh, oh, sorry. And when I was traveling home as well with the with the big loud yellow bag, which received an uncomfortable amount of knowing smiles and nods of approval, which I later recognized as being positive things. At the time, I thought I was just being stared at the whole time. No, nothing going on here. Nothing going here. I'm just a bright Lego store. That's what I am in the mall of life, and it was incredible because. Um, Okay, so sat down and I was, it was awesome because I was lost in that single process. So the noise of the week quickly dissipated and evaporated into nothing. Uh, and my smile increased with every page of instruction book being completed. There was accomplishment on every page along the way. And I went back to work feeling refreshed and was seeing the creative work start to show itself a little more easily because I just went somewhere else. What was incredible was the accidental discovery of essential and basic design principles along the way, which is amazing. I don't know if anybody has ever actually seen a Lego instruction manual. Talk about wayfinding and the ability to know exactly what it is, no matter where you're from or how old you are. It's very, very complex in its simplicity. It's absolutely gorgeous. And it's quality ink on quality paper. It's amazing. Like you compare that to that great Ikea instruction you got which in and of itself is pretty good but it needs things like words and other languages and Lego you just see Lego that's it and then a you know a URL to get to their website in any language you want it to be in very impressive very impressive um, so in regards to uh, exploring more, uh, however, I had no idea just how deep that rabbit hole went so it, it's it started with a van and then it kind of grew and I just could not, it's like suddenly I was going, was going back for more, going back for more and you know, just like plastic veins and junkies, like just hook this guy up. Um, I can be a bit obsessive when I'm into something or learning something new. I've always had something in my life which has allowed me to drift so I can refocus and recalibrate. Something to help to turn off all the noise and clutter and focus on a singular thing or action. Um, this is varied from the New York Times crossword puzzle, reading, and even marathon running. All ways to disengage and focus on a singular act or thought. It is the closest I've ever been to a meditative state, and I was thoroughly surprised to have accidentally found myself so enamored and smitten by Lego as a vehicle to drift in. Ultimately, this talk isn't about Lego. It's one way of going somewhere else. I don't know what your Lego is. Maybe it is Lego. Maybe it's something else. But what we're trying to do is disengage just long enough to refresh and refocus and go back to what it is we love to do so that we can remind ourselves as to why we love it and to see it again with fresh eyes. That's what we're doing here. Lego has also been a bit of an open door in regards to meeting and working with interesting souls. I had a good, uh, the good fortune to work with and, and hang out with Douglas Copeland for a while at Lego and Cocktails at the Vancouver Art Gallery, which was a little of a preliminary event to his exhibition coming up in spring summer at the Vancouver Art Gallery, uh, which should be quite an intriguing show. He is a, a, quite a collector of Lego, and it's amazing. He's also a, a, a grumpy old shit <laughs> for, the, for the most part. And, uh, but it, when, when, when he likes something, he just flips like he's just he's just curmudgeon 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 oh you like like oh 1949 oh let's talk and then it just he wouldn't shut up it was just amazing <laughs> fantastic soul wonderful and but it's amazing how the lego triggers a smile it's like cheekbones show up on people that wasn't there for in a while it's pretty incredible i love seeing that uh traveling to seattle for something called BrickCon 2013 yes <laughs> i went to a lego convention I went to a Lego conference. It's, I traveled for it. <laughs> I went specifically for that event. Nothing else was going on. I didn't have like another seminar. I wasn't doing a talk. I wasn't going to a restaurant. I mean, we did anyways, but 
I went to Seattle for a Lego con. I'm still trying to admit that right now to my friends <laughs> for the most part. This is where I learned a lot. <laughs> so I went to a conference specifically because it was 500 adults, no children. It's because they're distracting. Okay, they're in the way. They're taking your Lego. Okay. <laughs> so, so I went to this conference and I learned that I was an AFOL, and I'll speak to that shortly, on my way to a seminar on brick geometry focusing on snot techniques. <laughs> so I'm thinking, this is going to be awesome, because really I'm looking for the big displays they do, the grandiose builds, they're just amazing. Uh, they come from all over the world actually, to where there's incredible sculptures, and if you start Googling and seeing fine art with Lego, it's pretty outstanding. And then there's the not so fine art, that, that stuff is there too. And I'm, I'm wandering about, and uh, uh, so walking into this, this seminar and thinking to myself, all I'm going to see is a whole bunch of people that look just like the comic book collector and the bus driver from The Simpsons. And I was right. <laughs> it was, I've never seen so many ponytails on hair that starts here. <laughs> and heavy metal t-shirts with Lego rules. And it was awesome. It was so amazing. I had, and, I'm, and, I'm, and I was in there and I, was, I caught myself. I was judgmental. And I was one of them, <laughs> you know? And, and so we, that was my community. I realized we had a lot in common. And it's incredible how shy the majority of AFOLs are, which stands for Adult Fan of Lego. <laughs> They're so shy for the most part. And it seems kind of cold because you're, you know, getting it because you can be easily judged as a guy that plays with Lego as an adult. And I get it. I totally get that. But when you suddenly go past and you're realizing, wow, this is a lot of fun. This is really engaging. We can really enjoy this. And I'm, I'm now doing this with this. Oh, that's called a snot technique. And it's a what? That studs not on top. So that's when you get those clean surfaces on models or builds. It's just, yeah. So, so I'm walking into the seminar, brick geometry, <laughs> boring, uh, with snot building techniques. What the hell is that? And I'm thinking, I'm just, gonna, I'm just you know what, I just need to pass some time. The, the exhibition isn't open yet. I'm, I'm, I'm not hungry. I'm loaded up on coffee. I'm just going to bore myself to tears for a bit and then just go. Ten minutes in, I'm sitting there going, this is fucking fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> And it was, and, I, and I'm shocked, like I caught myself like laughing at myself, and that's one thing that killed me. Like everybody, once they're into it, is just smiling and laughing. There's just no negativity in a room full of Lego. It's amazing. And uh, I met Al Pacino at a Lego conference. <laughs> yeah. I know, that's why, I, I, it's like, and the only reason I know is because he's wearing a Toronto Maple Leafs hat, and of course, being from Vancouver, I didn't know whether to shake his hand or knock that off of his head, but uh, we just started chatting, and it's like, wow, I'm talking to Al Pacino, and he's at a Lego convention. <laughs> just sit with that, okay? <laughs> expect that. <laughs> didn't expect that. <laughs> but the real treat was to spend time conversing with Jamie Burrard. That's this guy over here. And uh, he's the lead designer for the Lego Creator Series and is responsible for the Sydney Opera House model, the new Parisian restaurant, and for you total Lego nerds, uh, he's also the voice of the Mindstorms EV3 robot set. So there's a total trivia bit for you along the way. So, and, uh, and that's not written anywhere. He told me that. Yeah. <laughs> total nerd. <laughs> um, being able to meet other designers from disciplines outside of my own is always a treat. But this meeting was especially enlightening in that not once did he ever complain. He always spoke so highly of the company, the craft, the process, the support for imaginative thinking, and he always, always spoke with a smile. And that's enviable. When we meet those people, first of all, we think they're insane. Then we're jealous. And then we wonder, what's their secret? And sometimes it's just plain loving what you do and finding an opportunity to really appreciate it and not being a millennial. <laughs> That was very on purpose for my, Mr. Mark Pussy. Okay. But um, these meetings and experiences and drifts have been wonderful for me, and I'm very grateful for this accidental discovery. But I think by far, far and away, the absolute greatest discovery has to be the fact that it has been in the form of time. I've been able to spend time with my brother, my nephew, my sister, my wife, my friends, and always in a state of laughter and enjoyment. 
until you step on that missing brick at night. <laughs> That's really all I got. Thank you so much. <laughs> He's already your turn. Um, how much money have you spent in Lego? <laughs> <laughs> uh, My in wife's Lego. here, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not a budget line item, I know that. <laughs> so um, I'm going to answer that with something that I knew I should have dropped this slide in. You know the meme with Batman slapping Robin and they're dropping in the little things in the bubbles there and Robin's going, it's so expensive. And Batman slaps him and goes, Lego is cheaper than it was 20 years ago with the price of inflation. And uh, <laughs> so that's my answer. <laughs> um, if you, I've got uh, easily tens of thousands of pieces, but that doesn't really say much because, you know, up there is a couple thousand pieces. And um, some of them are incredibly small. Some of them are much larger, of course. And of course, they're going to vary in price depending on the piece. And uh, if you look at sets that Lego builds, generally the price point is going to be about 10 cents a piece. So if you pick up a set and it's 2,500 pieces, it's probably just under $250. Um, I'm pointing it like it's still there. The VW bus, I believe, was 130. It's a creator series. It's tons of pieces. And it's the most, uh, it, it is by far the most um, uh, exciting build because it's so retro and you're, and you're diving into this, this place of, and if anybody's ever been in a VW van, and I don't know, I don't want to know what happened. <laughs> uh, I, okay, I had an English teacher in high school that after high school, we went in his Volkswagen van that he always drove, and in the middle of the van in the back, we didn't realize until afterwards, bolted to the floor was a hookah pipe. <laughs> that was it. That's all there was in the back. There, there was two seats and bolted and just hoses flailing around. He's, and he had the most amazing platform boots that were made out of suede and leather patches and this big walrus beard and huge. And he, he ate licorice seeds and drank peppermint tea the whole time. So that's your classic Lego fan of 19... <laughs> so the, but, the, 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 but the van, I don't, I, the total aside, thank you for that. I, I'm totally recalling childhood memories here. Um, but that van being $130, and based upon what I've, I've purchased since then, and those, I'd say the value of that build is, uh, it's obviously not priceless, but it's ridiculous how enjoyable it was for that price point. Like, and it keeps you busy for a long time. I, I wasn't trying to point out um, or, or narrow in on uh, even costs or anything, but just to sort of even think about it. I mean, there's probably a lot of people in the room that we could ask about, like, how much did you spend on books last mm -hmm. year? Mm -hmm. Like a large number, who cares? Yeah. Thing, right? um, but I th I would I would try to also add the the um, the element of time and quality of time, and there's like I can go to um, Hawksworth and spend hundreds of dollars for dinner, and did I get value for that? Well, in many ways you can. It depends on what you're looking for, or you can go in and criticize the event and not enjoy it and and be disappointed. That can happen with anything anywhere. So maybe you just don't buy it if you're not in the mood to enjoy. Uh, but if it, if, if it could potentially be a trigger to switch that, it doesn't matter what you're spending the, the money on, do it. So an investment into peace of mind, I'd, I'd say it's well worth it. And that's me justifying the expense right now. That's, that's what I'm doing. That's what I do. But I, I, do know, I do know it gets to the point where I spent way too much because uh, as a Lego VIP, which... Every, <laughs> It's great marketing. As soon as you buy anything, you're already a Lego VIP. All you just, just what's your email address? Oh, you're a VIP. Woohoo! So every, you, you, I think for every hundred dollars, you get a five dollar credit, right? And I remember one time I went in, I got this two hundred and fifty dollar set, whatever it was, and they go, Oh, do you want to apply your credit? I go, Oh, how much I got? She goes, You got about three hundred dollars in credit. <laughs> I go, I'll take the set, please. <laughs> And this one too. <laughs> it's a bonus. Okay, here we go. <laughs> so yeah, that's so quick. <laughs> Are you spending any time off the book? What do you mean? Uh, building outside the kits. Totally, absolutely. And but I, uh, for me, 
being the inner retentive Virgo, following the rules, every set I buy, I build it exactly as was intended because what I found is that every single set teaches you a new technique of building. So once you start to see how they see those building structures come together, then you can start to explore further. Like anything, once you've understood the basics or foundations and, and, the, and the, the core principles and philosophies of anything, now you're allowed to experiment and explore. But if you just walk into something and go, dude, I'm not fucking doing that. I'm totally going off on my own thing. Awesome, have fun. It's going to have very little respect, rapport, or uh, probably use when all is said and done. Off book right now quite a bit. And it's mainly because uh, uh, my wife Nicole is here and, and we've got this little ham stuffed hamster from Daiso that's been living with us for about 20 years now. And uh, it travels with us. And so suddenly I built this little RC Lego car and she's like, well, Hammy needs a car. <laughs> I got to build Hammy and, and it's not the same size as a minifig. We're talking custom sizing now. <laughs> So if you see the videos on Instagram, we're like drag racing <laughs> at Lego speed. It's like, eh, eh, eh. Just, come on, you're gonna come on, you can go. And there's this stuffed hamster posed in there. So, not, not, not just off book, Rob. I'd say off the charts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's fun. That, that's where you really, and that's where days disappear. And that can be actually scary sometimes but yeah it's like now i'm like setting alarms okay like eight hours in eat 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 okay like, you know you know it's bad when you're doing something and you actually have to set times for coffee breaks lunches and you know time with family and let them play too yeah any other thoughts comments questions Yeah, that that no, definitely not lifelong. No way, shiny object gone. Yeah, uh, so, so, somebody's going to inherit a really cool Lego collection soon because because when I'm done with it, I'm done with it, um, or maybe not. I don't know, but <laughs> right, right, that's that that would be my typical mo. Uh, what's amazing is how many times I've been asked about Lego and, and that because it, I'm just like that. I'll invest myself into something I'm very interested in. It, it appears like I'm an expert and, uh, and I'm not an expert when it comes to Lego. I'm just getting used to the idea of engaging off the book building and learning new techniques for that and studying the geometry for that, and, you know, snot techniques. And, but what's amazing is that this all started in June of last year. That's it. And it's, that's how quickly uh, it can go. And um, I don't see it waning in any way right now. Uh, what's happening is what Rob spoke to is that I, I bought the sets and followed the rules and regs for this long and now I've got a collection of pieces. And go, okay, now what am I going to build from this? I live in the Woodward's building. I'm going to build a Woodward's building in Lego. You know, I've just decided that just now <laughs> I'm going to do that because I was going to do City Hall, but somebody already did it. So I'm looking for that building that hasn't been done yet. So I don't know how it's going to happen. Don't know what other sets we need to buy our pieces, but I'm going to build a Woodward's building. Okay. So maybe I'll just eventually build all of Gastown. <laughs> because the Parisian restaurant I bought in the back has a Smith Wright. So if you can have one Smith Wright, you can build the entire DTES, right? Okay. It's going to be awesome. That's my, my neighborhood. That's my home. I, oh God! I just imagine minifigs for all the people I know. Don't. <laughs> Does that answer your question? Because I was trailing off. But I am getting back into the running side though now because sitting doing Lego, I, I saw a convention full of body types <laughs> that that are not conducive to healthy living. Yeah, yeah, and uh, so yeah, I'm getting back into the run right now. I want more. How have you displayed all? Of well, that's the joy of that's that's the joy of almost like um, um, do you know the the mandalas of the Zen Buddhists? You know where it's just colored sand. You can spend days and weeks and months building these out, and then you just brush it all off, put it in the container, and send it back from whence it came. So there's a real cathartic element to construction deconstruction. And I didn't speak to it. I, I, I meant to actually add that piece, but I, 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 I'm guilty of putting a, a, a talk together quite quickly. But in the builds I've done um, with the, with, after the Vancouver Art Gallery, I was asked to uh, speak at the Museum of Vancouver. 
uh, and uh, during uh, the exhibit's on right now, and it's Daniel White, who's a West Coast architect that is beautiful, beautiful uh, modern pieces from the uh, 70s. Uh, in the West Coast, and very geometric in shape, and, and, and beautiful explorations of shape, and and, and as a, a with a photographic background, you know, light, you know, everything is about what time of day is it, how does that building look, how does it transition through that space, and I spoke to it briefly in regards to being reminded of basic um, inherent uh, design principles, design laws, uh, lighting laws, and, and rules, understanding chiaroscuro, and 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 uh, the power of sh of shadow. And, and negative space. You know, all of that comes rushing back when you're building with a simple brick. It's a sculpting tool, and that's what people need to be reminded of. You're, you're creating sculptures. They're not as curvaceous as uh, uh, wood or marble or other things can be until you go really large in scale. With anything, you get little squares. You keep adding more and more squares. You can do a curve. It's just scaling that up. Um, but uh, I had the good fortune of being able to speak to this build day and we actually just got in a whole bunch of Lego and followed some of their plans and I actually got to take the, 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 the Mate house, which is one of his prized uh, architectural uh, pieces, that his um, architects in-house now did a scale version of in the Museum of Vancouver. And then what I did is that I, I built instructions and a model of that scaled version. And so people had the instructions and they can just build it while they were there and explore. And the amount of times that the architects were overhearing people saying, wow, I can't believe that it would do that. I didn't notice that when I looked at the building, but now I can see up close how that shape works and why you would want that space and how it looks bigger than it really is. And uh, as a sculpting aid and as an architectural tool, it's actually quite, quite uh, um, common in a lot of architectural firms, which is amazing. I went way off your question right there, but uh, uh, it does bring up the whole idea of, what was your question? How do you display all the things that you built? De deconstruction. So you I, I, take it all apart? I t yeah, right now, because uh, I don't know if you've been to Woodward's building, uh, I'd I need about another 2,000 square feet to display everything properly and, and to race Hammy around. <laughs> But uh, for, for, for the most part, uh, I'm now buying sets because I now look at them for pieces on what I want to put in somewhere else. But I still go through that entire set to see what it was like to, to construct and build. And um, so they're not really displayed. The only one that I've built, sorry, the only two I've built that are, have not been touched ever are the Volkswagen van, the very first one, and uh, R2-D2. And, and, and I'm not a, a Star Wars nut. I'm a Star Wars fan because I remember being a kid seeing it, but that R2-D2 is pretty cool when it's just sitting on your desk going, hey, what's up? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You finished that website yet? So you don't argue with R2. How do you manage the creative block of a drift with doing Lego and then getting sucked up into it and then not procrastinating and meeting well, that's a really good question because anytime you need to take yourself away from something that you know you should be doing, you need to be very uh, um, cognizant of that, uh, that time wasted. You know, where is that going? Uh, for some, it could be 10 minutes. It could be just, you know, go outside, walk around, get a cup of coffee, refresh and go back and you're good to go. And for others, it could be, I need a weekend away. I just need to decompress. And that could all be based on the intensity level of the project you're on or, or, or the work you currently have. Uh, I find that self-employed or freelancers usually have an easier time with that uh, because they actually are able to uh, do a more organic schedule as opposed to, you know, being in the agency and the guy says, okay, it's 9 a.m., create. <laughs> Go. <laughs> I need some Lego. <laughs> but so... Uh, to, to answer your question more succinctly, um, I'm, I'm very aware of it now, but it, it was a problem because I would just, because that's way more fun. But fun, not, at least not yet, uh, Lego building doesn't pay bills. And so uh, f fis fiscal responsibility, fiscal responsibility really does uh, push you back pretty quick. But I'm also going to say that uh, one of the joys of this particular hobby, fixation, affectation, uh, addiction, addiction <laughs> 12 steps, right? Um, is that you can just put it aside. It doesn't take up that much space. There's a lot of pieces, sure, you can, you can do a room full of it, but if you're doing so, you can just put it all into the thing, just put it away. I've got a, a cutting mat 
that you know the amount of actual physical paperwork I do anymore is very rare as opposed to talented artists in paper like Rachel Ash. But so I just use it as a bit of a platform. Just put it all on there and just put the book away. Just put it away for a while. You just go back to it when you need to. And I like that. I kind of I, I like seeing things unfinished that aren't a client project. <laughs> <laughs> so I can actually go back to the client work. Yeah. Does that help? Awesome. Come on. Have you received your Simpsons house yet? No. <laughs> I got a VIP access to the pre-order. So uh, <laughs> yeah. we, we leave for Hawaii on Saturday, and I'm really hoping it arrives tomorrow. <laughs> I won't be packing much. Okay. Uh, no, I have not received it yet. Has anybody seen it? I'm curious to see it. it looks yeah, nice. The Simpsons House. And also, j just Google it. Check out um, Breaking Bad Crack Lab. <laughs> awesome. Absolutely awesome. I, I had a lot of things that I wanted to show. That I, you know, I don't know where this is going yet, but maybe we'll do a. Actually, just check. I'll, I'll do, I promise you'll see it on Instagram. But check out the, uh, uh, the Breaking Bad Crack Lab. But, so, uh, a company called uh, Citizen Brick. Uh, third party, because the brick is not patented, you can make whatever you want, so they're doing custom screening of parts, so they were creating like the biohazard symbols on the barrels, uh, uh, the, uh, the blown off half face of, uh, the, sorry, I didn't want to, spoilers, of <laughs> <laughs> Breaking Bad, but, <laughs> you know, green, green vials, and even somebody built the Winnipeg, these are all unofficial sets, there's no way Lego would contribute to that. <laughs> that I know of. And, and as a matter of fact, Lego has never ever directly done a set that had anything to do with war. Uh, the owner since the get-go has always said there will never be a correlation to show children war. Just ninjas. Just ninjas. Now it's crazy, right? So, get, uh, Star Wars, uh, Lord of the Rings slashing, uh, Galaxy Squad. But remember, that guy that said that has been dead for 50 years. So, you know, the sons are going, hey, there's some money in this. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, check out the, the third party stuff. It's pretty cool, pretty wild. But yeah, Simpsons is official and uh, that's actually very high value. The number of pieces, uh, unique colors uh, in the elements, which is also interesting because every year the company um, removes elements from its system and then adds only a few. And uh, Lego was in a huge amount of trouble a number of years ago where it was ready for bankruptcy. And they act, and because they just uh, stretch themselves too thin, they were into the franchises like Lord of the Rings and Star Wars, and they were not used to cyclical buying patterns because when a movie was coming out, sales, sales, sales. But then there was a two-year glut where neither franchise was putting out a film, and they put all their money into those parts and those sets, and they just sat idle. So they're, they're, they weren't used to that. They're using this constant stream. So their plan was actually against a lot of business planning and they actually started reducing their inventory of what they had available but increasing their versatility. So now we have more affordable access to the parts or the elements and they're also way more versatile. And you'll see the, the very odd, bizarre pieces, like I even saw in this setup, there's a few things in there that there's no way they're making those anymore. And you look at it and go, what do I use that for? And it might have been specific to a set and now they're trying to break away from that, unless it's a Smith right. Which is actually a collection of very common parts. Okay. The Parisian restaurant's a, be a beautiful, beautiful piece. And it's the first time they came out with a Vespa. <laughs> For you hipster scooter kids. <laughs> Come on, I, this is fun now. Uh, what was the thing that was part of your creative process before Lego? Part of my process or part of my escape from process? Because <laughs> The role it plays now is, is more of that distraction or that incubation. Uh, running. It was running. And, and then uh, I hadn't been running for a while and to the point where um, running was kind of also like my answer to a midlife crisis. It was either a comb over in a Corvette or, 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 uh, or get healthy. So I just, I just needed something to go a lot further. So I ended up, ended up running like eight marathons in, in three years or four years. It, and never mind the half marathons and the training. But that's, that's what I mean. Like I'm that person that goes a little too far. <laughs> but don't take my word for it. <laughs> and uh, so that was, and, and before that, it was literally the, like the New York Times crossword puzzle. Because, uh, I mean, can anybody relate to this? Uh, you have a busy week, a busy day. You know you got to be up early. There's, you know you're completely non-functional at this particular hour in the evening, regardless of what that hour is. And you know you just need to rest. And you go to bed, and you lay on the pillow, 
and your eyes are wide open and it's just noise, noise, noise. And so I would lean over and grab the New York Times and I'd, I would buy like the, the bound volumes from Book Warehouse are really cheap on discount because I hadn't done them before. So there's years I can go back on now. And I would grab it and I'd look at it and there'd be that one word, I'd be focused on that one word and I was putting all my energy into that one word like loge, L-O-G-E, a balcony in a theater. But the, the clues would be like Italian seat. I go, oh, what is that? It's only four letters. And suddenly I'd be looking at it. <laughs> and I only, and this is the Frank Sinatra quote, anybody familiar? You only do crossword puzzles in ink. Because they were saying, like, he was a, a nut for crossword puzzles, which in our an interview turned me on to crossword puzzles. And he says, why do you always do it in ink? He says, of course you do it in ink. You either know it or you don't. <laughs> this is an aside. <laughs> But it also, uh, I got better at crossword puzzles because you do commit to it. You don't just randomly put in letters and then erase a bunch of stuff. You actually start, you wait, you really think it through further, and then you commit to that. But I've got a lot of crossword books with pen trails with <laughs> on me and the <laughs> sheets. Okay, so sorry about that. <laughs> Trevor. Yeah, um, as a kid, for me, Lego just came in bins. It mm -hmm. didn't come in sets. It always came in sets. All right, for me it came in bins yep. then. Yep. And there was, this, there was this kind of sense of kind of free association and like building mm -hmm. whatever you wanted. Mm -hmm. um, as I got older, I saw sets kind of gain dominance, I guess. Or they, I, I mm -hmm. kind of poo pooed the idea that it somehow destroyed imagination and kind of came in kind of preconceived uh, uh, configurations. Mm -hmm. um, how do you, what, what do you see in kind of like the, 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 the step between putting something to get together and then the deconstruction of that and then the free association of, of just kind of building whatever, however you see it fitting together. Uh, to, you need to disassociate from whatever theme is being delivered. So the sets always have a theme. So like the creator series, they're meant to, off, they're meant to be like one-offs. So you've got like the Sydney Opera House. Well, it's not going to blend in. There's no, there's no collection of Lego sets, opera houses of the world. <laughs> yet, yet, I'm sure. I'm sure uh, uh, La Scala would be a nice one, though. Um, but w something like a franchise like Star Wars, well, then you're tapping into an already uh, developed target audience because you're going to have collectors that buy it and never open it. And then you're going to have those that just dive into it because they're crazy for it and throw away the box right away. And, uh, and, but they're, because they're familiar with it and they stay in that genre. They won't even look at Lord of the Rings. Oh, that's the other thing I learned at this convention. Somebody would say castle and a whole half the room would go, castles! Yeah. And, <laughs> and, and then, they, then they'd mention the word space and the other half would go, space! <laughs> and there was this, there's this real tribe mentality with castles versus, and, there, and even, even their displays, they're separated. Like the, there's there's this path that like don't don't mix a spaceship over with the castles. That's, that's like that that's steampunk. That's in its own ge generation way over there. Uh, but to answer to that, what's what I consider it a set. What's always been available is a bucket of bricks. You can still get that today, but that gets tired to look at, and it kind of ties into this as well. If you're familiar with it, you know what it is. You've seen it before. Even though you could explore deeper, you want something else, and that could help trigger reinventing that or reseeing that or refocusing or recalibrating call it what you will uh, for me it's it's all still new it's all still fresh is that you know i'm learning their sets i'm learning their their themes and there's some things that i'll get oh it's on sale it's got nothing of value to me and now like i said i'm looking at parts so that spoke to what you said before is that now i can see the imagination side is actually coming up where now i'm thinking what would i build if i was a lego designer if i was a lego engineer what would i want to build what are they already working on? Because they're two to three year rollouts for idea, development, testing, production. Because the dyes they make are, are, are very involved. Like I said, you know, out of a million pieces, only 18 don't reach spec. Uh, and also when you see, uh, I was mentioning this earlier, is that when you see bricks, a colored brick versus a transparent brick, they're t even though they're exactly the same size, and the classic brick that we saw here was a two by four, they're called. and um, even though they're exactly the same size, they are two different materials and they require two different dyes because of the way that substrate cools and expands. So when they do click together later, it's, it's that telltale click, no flaw whatsoever. Uh, once again, I'm traveling off on the, on the question, but there's nothing wrong with taking all the sets you have and putting them into a big bin and starting all over again with that, in that way. 
And I'm looking forward to getting my brother over to help me catalog and inventory it all because it's now, it's now too much for me. I, I, look at it, I, I can't do that right now. It's crazy. And that's a lot of the architectural models. Lots of tiles. Tiles, tiles, tiles. So there's this poster from the 80s of a little red-headed girl in braids and her overalls, and it's a Lego ad, and it's going around, it goes around Facebook every few months uh, to the irate commentary of people about marketing to girls versus boys that's so, so rampant now. Um, how many... How many women were at the Lego Con? And yeah. okay, so 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 that's my that's my main question. And then I want to as well say that I was in the Lego store with my three-year-old a few weeks ago, and I bumped into a friend who has a three-year-old little girl and a six-year-old little boy. And the boy is a Lego fanatic. I mean, fanatic. He's obsessed. It's his thing. Mm -hmm. It's all he talks about. He's he's amazing at it. It's what he does. And she said that. Her daughter had no interest in it, despite it being a constant presence in their house, until one day she saw the pink box. And so my friend, who was very inclined to roll her eyes about the ridiculous marketing and how offensive it is and why do we need to have it that way, was suddenly like, well, it got her into it. Um, so my question is, yeah, how many, how many women were there? What's your experience of the culture, if there is one, of, of women in the major hardcore Lego fan base? Define women. <laughs> non male. <laughs> uh, I would suggest about thirty percent, and a okay. lot and a lot larger than I would have expected. Okay. And as a matter of fact, two of the top builders are are women. Um, I forget her last name, but Alice, who created the Hogwarts, you might have seen. It's like three hundred thousand pieces. It's the entire castle, and she just did all of uh, Rivendell. Uh, in the latest one, and it's 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 bigger than this space here, and you're seeing all of it. And then she, and then just like that weekend on the Friday night, she goes, I think I'm going to build that that water scene where the horses turn the if the wa the river turns into horses, and it's all done out of clear, transparent bricks and taken down the the ring race. And and at that point, I don't care. You call me a nerd and a geek. That's impressive because <laughs> they're, they're not only is just to imagining it, to see it, to see what you need to build with the bricks you currently have available, and talk about an inventory. How do you just suddenly go? You know, I'm just going to need about three thousand clear bricks, a one by two, and a few of the. All right, where do I got those? And <laughs> off they go. It's amazing, and the weight of this stuff. So you know, you'd think they'd be a little fitter, but that's not happening yet. <laughs> But yeah, I'd say at least 30% and uh, very impressive uh, on the awards scale of that too for, for um, uh, being written about and being acknowledged. But in regards to the marketing, I, I, I guess I kind of avoid that section. You go to Lego store, there's like the, the Duplo and the kids section and, and I go there for my niece and that's about it. Uh, but I think they just came out with a whole new line that was really targeting girls and that, um, What's it called? Friends. Friends. Yeah, yeah, and it's and it's becoming really popular. Apparently, that they they were hoping for an increase of let's say you know ten percent in that area, and it went to like forty. Uh, like Lego, in the last five years, as far as a business model is concerned, uh, has on average increased sales thirty three percent every year for five years. Yeah, profit, clear, clear profit. That's why it's now the second largest company. So I, I don't know if any other company is doing that and whoever their accountant is, I want to hire them because I need to buy more Lego. <laughs> Pretty impressive, yeah. Anyone else? Chris. Are you planning on going to one of the Lego lands? That brings up a whole new story as an aside, but you know what, I'd like to, but I want to go with my sister and my nephew. I want to see that place through his eyes. I want, and uh, I know he's been to San Diego before, to Legoland there. Uh, there is one in Toronto, but get this, it's the only one in Canada. And I thought, oh, well, maybe I'll just zip down to, uh, you know, when I'm in Toronto, I'll zip down and go have a look at there. I'm an adult without a child. I can't get in. <gasps> what? Yeah, adults aren't allowed to go on their own. You have, yeah. to, have a child. You have to have a child with you as a chaperone, obviously. <laughs> but there is, yeah, what, what? <laughs> but, it, but, it, but, it, but it's only it's only Toronto. No, it's only Toronto. It's only Toronto. It, it, I, I, I looked into this. <laughs> no, no, it's only Toronto. Yeah, and uh, yeah, was, there was a story about that. There's, like this, this 
60-year-old guy went with his daughter, who's 30, and they went in and they said, sorry, you're gone. I'll do a five-hour drive out there and then back. They just skips it. Absolutely not. They, but once a month, they have an evening for adults only. And you think, oh, okay, well, at least they have that. And I'm thinking, why would I want to go to Legoland with only adults at night? That's like, that, that's like the freakiest dating service ever. <laughs> you know, it's, 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 it's like, uh, what's happening? But, uh, yeah, <laughs> not official, <laughs> and I'm not building it. <laughs> but you know, it's the internet. You want you whatever you want to find, you will find it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that's awesome. Are you going to see the Lego movie? With my nephew. Yeah, let's try that. Yeah, <laughs> how's that working so far? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. I'd have to like steal that kid from some mall, I guess. Um, <laughs> no, but, but but once again, I, I think what I love about the franchise in so many ways is that it it appeals to such a, a a tremendously large target audience, and it's very hard to find a single product that can actually meet the needs or demands of a very large target audience in regards to age demographics. So, I'm as a, from a marketing and design perspective, I'm really curious to see how that engagement unfolds. What does he remember? What does he pull back from it? To me, it's just going to be another animated film. Now, don't get me wrong. I really appreciate quality animation film, but uh, you know, I, I'd probably be more inclined to enjoy something like uh, Up, which was just a, a beautiful film. And you know, it's like, oh, oh, it's like the old touchy feel. I don't think the Lego Movie is going to have a touchy feely point in it. Uh, it's like it seems to me they got a very hyperactive ca main character in it. But I have seen all the trailers, so if that's any indication, I'll be there for sure. I think it's more of a musical. Oh God. <laughs> And, and, yeah, and I'm now at that age where I don't know any of the people that are singing anymore. So <laughs> because they're not bringing Susie and the Banshees out for that. Uh, Let's wrap up there, okay, does anybody have a child? You've got a three-year-old, you said, back there? How about, how about a little shirt for him there? We could, yeah. These are all donated by uh, Jelly Marketing, who's a marketing team behind um, uh, that helped out with the Vancouver Art Gallery and the Museum of Vancouver Lego. And so, can you pass that just back to her? Does it give a pencil and a, uh, a t-shirt? Whoops. No, sorry, wrong shirt. That, well, okay, you know, like that. that one's for you. This one's for the kid. There we go. <laughs> oh, hey. oh, That's all right. And, uh, no, no, keep them. Oh, keep them. Thank you. Well, unless somebody wants to fight you for it. <laughs> all right. This one's for Mark. <laughs> <laughs> or anyone else who would like it. This would probably fit you best. What do you think, Beardo? You're going to go for it? All right. <laughs> and I've got pencils. Everyone likes pencils. Schwag, schwag. Rob, you want a pencil? <laughs> You're, oh, you'll take it. Yeah, how's that pencil? Uh, <laughs> these are child. And who was the other total nerd that raised their hand? Is that another Lego nerd somewhere? No? Okay, there we go. Careful. <laughs> Perfect. Um, I'm here all night. Come on down, ask questions. And also, uh, go back and play. That's what that stuff is for. Discover, explore. And uh, I did put up my, um, on Instagram and Twitter, you can reach me through there. That's the, my, my studio. I'm going to holiday for a couple of weeks, but honestly, if you have any questions, any thoughts, there, uh, that t-shirt's advertising Brick Games, which is happening in the fall. There are some local events. And, and four kids and four families is actually, they're, they're actually a lot of fun. They're very engaging, very intriguing. So if you have any interest at all, look at what's happening in your local calendar. If you have any questions, let me know. I, it's, it's not hard to smile and have a good time with a subject like this. Thank you all very much for your time. Appreciate it.